Armageddon, the very word, shakes our soul. It has inspired books, movies, video games, paintings, and endless commentary. The very name conjures up pictures of vast armies, horrible suffering, and widespread devastation. It has created a host of speculation and embellishment that is not scriptural. It has taken on a life of its own since spoken by John the Revelator in Revelation chapter 16. Do we understand what Armageddon really is and when it is going to happen? That is what this video will discuss. In reality, this is Armageddon. The name Armageddon is derived from the Hebrew Har Megiddon, meaning the mountain of Megiddo. The valley of Megiddo is on the western portion of the plain of Estrelon, the great and final conflict that John the Revelator speaks of, which will take place near the time of the second coming, is called the Battle of Armageddon because it will begin here. Megiddo is 50 miles north of Jerusalem and is the site of several crucial battles in the Old Testament times. Battles with Assyrians, Babylonians, Romans, Egyptians, Crusaders, and Muslims have all happened here. It is called Haman Gog by Ezekiel. This will be where a great army is gathered before laying siege to Jerusalem in the last days. Some erroneously conclude that the final battle of the war will be fought there. But as Elder Bruce R. McConkie points out, the final struggles will center around Jerusalem, though they may extend to Megiddo. Ezekiel prophesies about this war being led by Gog, a leader from the land of Magog, which happens just prior to the second coming. He also refers to Meshus as a principality or area within Magog. Most reference books since Josephus generally identify Meshus in Ezekiel's time as an area in modern Turkey and an area of Magog here in red surrounding the Black Sea. According to the church's Old Testament student manual, Gog is a symbolic name for the leader or leaders of this great evil power that will arise in the last days. Ezekiel named Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer, and Togarma as being in alliance with Gog. These destinations refer to general areas of the ancient world. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, The prophecies do not name the modern nation which will be fighting for or against Israel, but the designation Gog and Magog is given to the combination of nations which are seeking to overthrow and destroy the remnant of the Lord's chosen seed. This makes sense because Ezekiel says that they will come upon Jerusalem from the north parts. Ezekiel is very clear that he is talking about the latter days. Ezekiel is describing what Daniel called the abomination that maketh desolate and says that this will go on for 1,290 days. This is one of the key places where we get the 3.5 year period just prior to Christ's second coming. But remember that Daniel's prophecy is one of multiple fulfillments. I have mentioned multiple fulfillments before, and some people don't like the notion of multiple fulfillments. I think people feel like if there can be multiple fulfillments, then we are trying to map an event to anything we want rather than definitively mapping a prophecy to a fulfillment of that prophecy. But that just simply isn't the way many prophets wrote their works. Daniel and Isaiah, as well as many others, are well known for listing prophecies that were fulfilled during their time, the time of Christ, and will again be fulfilled in the last days. I believe this is one way we can find patterns of what to expect in the last days by looking for what happened before. When it comes to Daniel's prophecy of the abomination of desolation, one fulfillment is what Christ spoke of in Matthew 24, 2, where it says, quote, There shall not be left here one stone upon another. This was literally fulfilled in 70 AD when Titus destroyed Jerusalem and an estimated 1.1 million Jews were killed. The Arch of Titus in Rome celebrates the Roman victory, where you can see carved into the arch a rendering of the Romans hauling the spoils from the temple back to Rome. But in Doctrine and Covenants 84 verses 117, the Lord warns of another desolation of abomination that awaits the wicked in the last days. It says, quote, And verily I say unto you, the rest of my servants, go ye forth, as your circumstances shall permit, in your several callings, unto the great and notable cities and villages, reproving the world in righteousness of all their unrighteous and ungodly deeds, setting forth clearly and understandingly the desolation of abomination in the last days. In the Guide to the Scriptures, under Abomination of Desolation, it says, Speaking of the last days, of the days following the restoration of the gospel and its declaration for a witness unto all nations. Christ in the New Testament said, And again, 
shall the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet be fulfilled. Zechariah said, At the very moment of the second coming of our Lord, all nations shall be gathered against Jerusalem to battle. So the battle of Armageddon, obviously covering the entire area from Jerusalem to Megiddo and perhaps more, will be in progress as the Lord returns. The combined armies will be massive. Ezekiel talks about a great company like a storm and a cloud to cover the land with many people. Daniel describes a great army like a whirlwind. Joel says there will be the greatest army in the history of the world up to that point and describes it like fire that devours the land, leaving it as desolate wilderness. John the Revelator, using imagery of locusts that bring devastation, even give the count of the army as 200 million. Joseph Fielding Smith said, quote, One thing that we are given by these prophets definitely to understand is that the great last conflict before Christ shall come will end at the siege of Jerusalem. How can tiny Israel stop such a massive, well-equipped army? Two witnesses, as they are called in the book of Revelation, they are also referred to as two candlesticks, two olive trees, and in modern-day Revelation, two prophets. These two, with the sealing power, will call down from heaven all manner of plagues that will hold back the army for three and a half years. They will have power like Elijah, who called down fire from heaven to consume his enemies. They will seal the heavens that it will not rain during this time. There is another video just on these subjects if you're interested. After three and a half years, the two prophets will be captured and killed by the opposing army, and their bodies will be left in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days, as the forces of evil engage in the great celebration over their death. The army then ravages the city and all who remain in it. Zechariah says that only one-third of the nation of Israel will survive this final extremity when the city shall be taken. I also have a video on the two witnesses for more information on that, but there are many events that must happen prior to this. During what is one of the most darkest moments in Israel's history, just as it appears that they are about to be annihilated, the Lord's fury will be unleashed upon the kingdoms of the world, and the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. An earthquake will strike the earth, affecting the whole world, the greatest earthquake the world has ever known. Thankfully, we are promised that the righteous will be spared if they do all things whatsoever God commands us. But if we don't, we will take part in the plagues and pestilence brought upon the wicked. So how can we be ready to hear? Prior to the Roman siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD, Christians living in Jerusalem remembered that the Savior had warned, Then let them who are in Judea flee into the mountains. And they fled to a city called Pella in the northern foothills of the Jordan Valley. Though the Jews living in Jerusalem experienced starvation and eventual destruction during the Roman siege, those who heeded the Savior's warning safely escaped. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, referring to this event leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, stated, The council that the saints should then stand in the holy place meant that they should assemble together where they could receive prophetic guidance that they would preserve them from the desolation of that day. So the Savior's prophecy, recorded in Matthew 24, verses 16 through 22, refers both to the great tribulation suffered by the Jews in 70 AD and to the great tribulation that will happen in the latter days. In 70 AD, things became so bad that if the Lord had not intervened and shortened those tribulations, the Jewish people would have been annihilated. The Lord's intervention will also be necessary in the latter days in order for his people to survive. While the Bible doesn't speak of this, historians recorded that it was about four years before Titus began the siege on the city that the faithful followers of Christ saw the signs and fled to Pella. According to these historians, not a single believing Christian died in these battles because they had all fled to Pella. I find it interesting that the two witnesses in the last days will hold back the army from Armageddon for three and a half years, perhaps the exact same amount of time the ancient Christians believers had as a warning. Knowing that Daniel's prophecy has multiple fulfillments, I would venture to guess that we too need to flee to the mountains of Zion once we see the beginning of Armageddon. This three and a half year period is repeated over and over in scripture. 
While we often hear talks about a generic stand in holy places, getting us to go to the temple more and to make our homes havens for the Spirit, in the context Christ actually meant this, he is saying when you see these signs, get out of Dodge. Go stand in the holy place. Go to Zion now, which will be the only way to protect yourselves and your family. In fact, in a June 1989 Ensign article entitled, Be Ye Also Ready, it says, quote, The Lord taught of two major signs that would alert believers to flee. The first is when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies. The other is that men of approved piety would be given warning and warn the faithful. We know we will be called to Zion, and this, I believe, is when and how we will be called. I think that Ezra Taft Benson summed it up the best when he said, quote, In the light of these prophecies, there should be no doubt in the mind of any priesthood holder that the human family is headed for trouble. There are rugged days ahead. It is time for every man who wishes to do his duty to get himself prepared physically, spiritually, and psychologically for the task which may come at any time as suddenly as the whirlwind. Thanks for watching.